Hi, and welcome to the Assembly Lines Podcast. I'm Chris Torrance. I know it's been a while since I last did an episode, but I've been really busy with things like Kansas Fest as well as getting my kids off to college. Hopefully I'll have some time in the next few months to get out more videos. I wanna keep going with my Apple II emulator series. In the last few episodes, we showed how we could read from floppy disks in the emulator, as well as getting sound and joysticks to work. In this episode, I'm gonna talk about how I got writing to floppy disks working. So let's get started. If you recall from previous episodes, I've been building an Apple II emulator using TypeScript and React. And I've been running this in Chrome. I've gotten most things working for a regular Apple II Plus. One of the things that I've been working on more recently was getting the reading and writing of floppy disks to work. I already talked about how I got reading disks to work, and so now I wanna talk about how I got writing to work. There's a couple books that you'll wanna have as references if you're trying to do something like this yourself. The first one is either Beneath Apple DOS or Beneath Apple Pro DOS. For discussions about the soft switches as well as the memory layout on the Apple II, you'll definitely wanna have a copy of Inside the Apple IIe. And then finally, another great reference to have is Understanding the Apple II. And there's another version of this called Understanding the Apple IIe as well. And especially chapter nine in either one of those books talks a lot about the floppy disk controller. Let's dive into the code now and see how I implemented reading and writing from floppy disks. Here's my disk emulator running in Chrome. If I click on the floppy disk icon, I can go ahead and pick a WAS image and open that up and it loads it into the disk and then I can hit the boot button and it'll go ahead and boot the drive. Okay, and you can see that it booted up the disk. So we clearly have reading from floppy disks working. However, what I really wanna do is writing. So let's go over now and see how I added support for that. All right, this is my React and TypeScript project for the emulator. This is all up on GitHub, so if you wanna go over and look at the actual code, I'll put a link in the show notes for that. I divided up the code into various sections depending on the hardware. Right now we're looking at a file called diskdrive.tsx. The X at the end of that indicates that this has React code in addition to regular TypeScript code. And this file is in charge of putting the disk to icon on the emulator itself, as well as changing the icon if you insert or remove a floppy disk. It also controls converting from WAS format. And as we'll see, I actually added support for disk images, DSK, as well. Let's now look at how I handled the read and write switches. Right now I'm in a function called handle drive soft switches. Every time you access memory on the Apple II in my emulator, it goes through a soft switch handler to see if the address is in the range C000 to CFFF. And these are all the soft switches in the Apple II that control things like text or graphics mode, as well as all of the disk drive switches. So this function here handles the disk drive switches specifically. And what it does is it's basically just a large switch statement or a bunch of if statements depending on what switch is coming in. Most of these should be familiar from one of my previous episodes when we talked about reading. So for example, here's a couple soft switches for turning the floppy disk motor on and off. Here's ones for doing the stepper motors, which move the arm of the floppy disk inwards or outwards to go from track to track. And then down near the bottom, we have all the addresses for reading and writing. Some of these were already in here before, but there's a couple new ones. The first two switches here control whether you're in read or write mode for your disk drive. And these are at C08E and C08F plus whatever your slot offset is. So for example, if your floppy disk controller is in slot six on the Apple II, you would actually add 60 hex to these numbers and you would get C0EE and C0EF. 
The next two soft switches that we need to talk about are C08C and C08D. These are actually pretty complicated and you wanna take a look at Jim Sather's Understanding the Apple II book to understand what these are doing. They actually depend upon the settings of the other two soft switches as well, whether you're in read mode or write mode. The general gist of them is if you're in read mode, then calling C08C will actually retrieve the next byte from the floppy disk. If you're in write mode, then triggering C08C actually starts the shift register inside the logic state sequencer in the disk two controller, and it starts shifting bits out to disk. I'll go into this in a little bit more detail, but for my emulator, I actually don't even need to do anything when I see C08C if I'm in write mode. C08D is the soft switch that's used for loading new data into the disk two controller in preparation for writing out. And in my Apple II emulator, it's also the trigger for writing a byte out to the disk image stored in memory. Let's talk now about how writing to floppy disks actually works in the Apple II. This is a schematic of the disk two controller in the Apple II. It's actually a tiny little computer that gets its two megahertz clock signal from the Apple II slot and then feeds that over into what's known as the logic state sequencer. This is a tiny little computer or state machine that controls the running of the floppy disk drive itself. The logic state sequencer in the disk two controller card has 256 instructions that are running at two megahertz. This is actually twice as fast as the one megahertz of the Apple II computer itself. The state of the sequencer is controlled by eight switches. Four of these come from the sequencer itself and just keep it running from one instruction to the next. Two come from our soft switches C08C to C08F. One depends on the data register high bit and the last is set by a read pulse. The important thing is that once you set one of those soft switches, it puts the logic state sequencer into a particular state and then it just starts running through its own instructions independent of the Apple II until it receives another soft switch which puts it into a different state. Let's take a look now at the assembly language code that's actually used to write data out to the floppy. In the program on the right-hand side, we're gonna write out the very first byte of data to a floppy disk. Here, we're loading our data value into the accumulator, so this would be like an eight-bit value, and then we're going to start the writing process. And to do that, we're gonna store that accumulator value at an index location of C08F, with an offset of X. And in this case, for slot six, for example, that offset would be 60. And then after that, we're going to trigger the write to actually start by accessing memory location C08C, again, with a indexed offset of 60. And this will actually start it shifting bits out to disk. The disk two controller has its own data register on board. And once it sees that C08C, it's going to start shifting bits out of that data register. And if it sees a one bit, then it's gonna go ahead and write a one signal onto the floppy disk. If it sees a zero, it's not gonna write anything, but the disk is gonna keep moving along and effectively that's going to be a zero bit. The key is that this is just gonna happen independently of what the Apple II is doing. Here is a slightly more complicated that shows writing out the first byte of data followed by writing out the next byte after that. So again, you can see on the left, we've loaded our accumulator with data one. We're storing that into the disk two's memory register at C08F, and then we're starting the shift process by accessing C08C. At that point, we have to essentially sit there until the disk two controller has written out all eight bits. It turns out that the disk two controller card takes eight cycles to output one bit. Remember that the disk two controller card is running at twice as fast as the Apple II. So if it takes eight cycles for the disk two controller card, that is four cycles of the Apple II's processor. So we need to wait at least 32 cycles before we again access the card. And so you can see that in the middle there, we have a bunch of PHA and PLA instructions, as well as a bit and a no-op. And this whole process here is just to waste enough time so that 32 cycles have gone by.
Finally, when we get to the appropriate time, we load our accumulator with the next data value. So there's the load with data two. And then we store that into C08D this time. We're already in write mode, so we don't need to trigger that again. And then we again access C08C to tell the disk two controller to start shifting out the next byte of data. The total time between accesses to C08C, therefore it needs to be 32 clock cycles of the Apple II to ensure that all of the bits have been written out. The interesting thing is for the floppy disk format, we also need to write out those sync bytes, which we talked about in an earlier video. These are actually nine bit or 10 bit, and they have the value FF or 255, followed by either one zero or two zero. You can guess how these are written out now, which is rather than waiting 32 clock cycles, instead you wait 36 cycles for a nine bit value or 40 cycles for a 10 bit value. And this is how these self sync bytes get written out to disk. Now let's switch back to my Apple II emulator and see how I solve this. If you're writing an Apple II emulator, you have a couple different ways that you can handle the logic state sequencer in the disk two. One way would be to implement a two megahertz computer that's running alongside or parallel with the 6502. And you could do this using a completely independent timer function that just triggers at two megahertz. I thought about doing this. However, it adds a lot of complexity and the timing of my emulator isn't really that great anyway. The, I know that the emulator is not really running at exactly one megahertz. And at some point I'll need to tackle this by probably running the whole thing in a separate thread. So what I did instead is kind of take the poor man's approach because at this point, all I really care about is the delta in time between calls from one load or shift register instruction to the next call to that same soft switch. So I have a global variable here called cycle count. And when you first start up my Apple II emulator, it just starts this at zero and it just keeps track of all of the 6502 cycles and it just grows larger and larger. In addition, I have another counter here inside my disk drive code called previous cycle count. And this gets reset every time I set this soft switch or if I set one of the other soft switches that would trigger it. So when I go ahead and I receive a soft switch of C08D, I simply call this do write byte function that I've written with the delta, which is the difference between the current cycle count of the 6502 and the previous cycle count. Let's take a look now at my do write byte and we'll see what's going on there. I first make sure that I actually have a data value to be written. And then I take a look at this delta value. Just as a sanity check, I wanna make sure that my delta in CPU cycles is at least some nominal value. So here I just decided to make it larger than 16. Technically, this should probably just be equal to 32, but I wanted to leave open the possibility that there might be some read write track sector programs that would have smaller deltas between their calls. And then all I do is I just start writing bits out to the disk one at a time using this do write bit function and then effectively just shifting out the bit values. So this is exactly what the logic state sequencer would be doing in a real disk to controller card. However, I'm actually just doing it in one for loop here and I'm not actually waiting for the two megahertz clock on the disk two controller card. I'm just spewing them out all at once, one after another. So let's take a look now at my do write bit function here. And if we scroll up to that, the first thing I do is get the current track location in the disk image that I have in memory. And this is my was disk image. And then I'm just finding the byte that's at that file offset within the disk image. And I'm just modifying the particular bit within that byte and then just storing it back in to the array. So this is effectively writing, if you will, out to my virtual floppy disk. And then I just increment the bit location, which is stored here in this track location value. Now, this is handling regular bytes. If I instead have received 
a CPU delta value of 36, for example, then I wanna go ahead and write out one additional zero. And so this would be for like a nine bit self-syncing byte. And if my delta is greater than or equal to 40, then I go ahead and write out yet another zero. And this would be for a 10 bit self-syncing byte. And then the last thing I do is first trigger that my disk image actually has changes to it. And then I clear that global data register. So this is the data register within the disk two controller card. Let's go ahead now and we'll switch over to my actual emulator and see this in action. I'm gonna go ahead and pick a blank disk image and I'm going to boot it up. Once it's booted, I'm gonna go ahead and just initialize the disk completely from scratch. And this involves writing a whole bunch of self-sync bytes as well as blank bytes all over the disk. And then finally, it will go ahead and construct the disk catalog and save the hello program on it. Let's go ahead and do that. And if you recall, the disc two noises that you're hearing in the background were actually just recorded on my Apple II Plus. I just used a microphone and I'm just playing those when I receive the appropriate soft switches. Now that it's done, if you remember, I had that little disc is dirty flag that I had set or disc has data. And if I click now on the drive, it'll go ahead and download that WAS file with my changes. I'm gonna go ahead and start up the Applesauce program. This is written by John Kenny Morris. This software was written for use with his Applesauce hardware device, which lets you plug a disk drive, either Apple or Commodore or others like PC, into a Mac, and it lets you do flux imaging of those disks. You can also write back out to floppy disks once you have a flux image. The file format that's used is the WAS disk image, which is supported in my emulator. However, you can also open up WAS images and take a look at the data. Let's open up the disk analyzer and I'll pick my WAS file that was just written out. And you can see here is a picture of the disk itself with all of the tracks. So here's all 35 tracks here. And then there are the individual sectors within it. And this is the actual data that was written out. And you can see that we have things like the famous D5AA96, indicating the start of a address field on a sector. Here's the D5AAAD, which is the start of a data field on a sector. And then here's the actual data itself. A different way to view this is to switch from the nibble stream to physical sectors and this shows you the actual data itself. So here's the track and the sector, the address field, the epilogue, here's the data field and here's the data. If we switch to say track 11, we can see here's my hello program that I saved on the disk. Let's make sure that this is actually a real disk. So since I've downloaded it, I should be able to just double click on it and open it up in virtual two. Okay, you can see that it's booted and we're gonna load our, we're gonna load our hello program and we'll list that. And there's our program that got saved. So as far as virtual two is concerned, this is a real or correctly written Apple II disk. So it seems like my emulator is actually working properly. Let's try a slightly more complicated program for testing our write output. I'll go ahead and I'll load up a disk copy program and we'll try that. So let's go and try this copy programs disk here and we'll boot that. And let's go ahead and pick disk muncher. Uh, 
and we'll just copy the disk on top of itself. So we only have one disk drive, so slot six, drive one, slot six, drive one. Yes, we have a RAM card, so we can go ahead and use that, that's fine. Uh, we don't have any other ones because it doesn't know about the aux card, so we can just go ahead and start. And we'll just let it rip. All right, so now we should have just overwritten our own disk. So let's boot and see what happens. Okay, and you can see that it booted up and maybe let's try a different program just to see if that starts up. So I'll run back it up three. All right, and that started up. So I think everything is working properly for both reading and writing to floppy disks. I also added support for DSK disk images, but I think I'll cover that in another video. I hope you enjoyed this episode on my Apple II emulator. We talked about getting writing to floppy disks working. In the next few episodes, I wanna talk about how I upgraded my emulator from an Apple II Plus to an Apple IIe, including getting aux memory working. I also wanna talk about 80 column mode in my emulator. And then finally, I've implemented a way to save and restore the state of the Apple II emulator. I'd like to thank all of my Patreon subscribers. If you aren't currently a subscriber, you can find the link to my Patreon down in the show notes. And I'd also like to encourage anyone who isn't currently a YouTube subscriber to hit the subscribe button below. I'd really appreciate it. If you're interested in getting one of these cool wizardry t-shirts, I'll have a link to Javier Rivera's 8-Bit Tees store in the show notes. Once again, thanks for watching.